Uh, one, two. Yeah, okay. Yeah, you made it. Over the last couple of months, from time to time, we've been reintroducing ourselves to one another and uh, just sharing a little bit about what life was like in COVID and what we're looking forward to in the future. So Norb said yes. <laughs> Maybe some of you will say yes in the future. Who knows? So glad to have you up here, Norb. Thank you. So the last year for many people has been challenging. We've talked a lot about challenges. What's been challenging for you? Um, for the last Especially when COVID started for us, it was very challenging not to be able to meet as a family. Uh, I know we have grandchildren and children, and you couldn't see them or meet them or hug them, which is really hard for us. Mm. And then slowly as things opened up a little bit, we could do that. But the extended family, we couldn't meet with them and, and hug them and, and celebrate with them life. But yeah, that's been the hardest thing, I think, during the whole COVID process for us. So you were hug deprived. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. So um, as COVID went along, did you find any surprising blessings or a little silver lining? Yeah, in there were some club? silver linings. Yeah. For one, when you're isolated at home, you get to spend a lot of time with your your spouse. Maybe it's my sweetheart Barb. So I spent lots of time with her. Maybe she didn't like it as much as <laughs> I did, but I sure enjoyed it. So that was good. And the other silver lining was. When Barb was uh, passing time, she would bake. So I would get to eat lots of donuts, <laughs> sourdough bread, pasta. I quickly realized I had to slow down a little bit because uh, things were gaining a little bit too fast. So. Well, you're looking surprisingly good. <laughs> <laughs> Face myself. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So tell us a little bit about uh, your walk with God over this year. How have you experienced him in these days? Um, for us, it was a lot of blessings, uh, not just sad things, but we're thankful for, uh, for one, YouTube. Usually you watch YouTube to learn how to fix your dishwasher or whatever, but we were watching YouTube to connect with Bakerview, so mm -hmm. that was a very a blessing for us. And then uh, BB Kids that Jeff was doing with the little ones, I enjoyed that too. And the Hymns of the Week, I enjoyed, enjoyed that a lot with Harry, just to get the history behind the hymn, which was kind of nice as well. And then uh, another blessing was we had another grandchild. So James was born to Jake and Trish. So nice. we yeah. were able to have a COVID baby, healthy and doing well. So we we're very thankful for that. So very good. Super linings. So you uh, took in kids things and you took in things for those of us who are on the older end. It's <laughs> a, a stellar example for us all, Norb. That's great. So here we are as Bakerview Church, starting to gather again and looking to head to the future. What are you hoping for for Bakerview for the future? For Bakerview, I'm hoping that we would continue to invest in our young families. I think that's a ministry that we need to really focus and key in on. I remember 32 years ago when Dennis Newman welcomed me and Barb to the church. And it was a genuine welcome and we enjoyed that and we've been plugged in ever since. So I think as a church, we need to continue to invest in marriage retreats, uh, children's ministry, all those kind of things that have a long-term benefit for the church. And I, I'd like to see that continue. Hmm. That's basically it. Well, thank you for sharing. Thank you for your service. Norb's on the uh, finance and maintenance team as well, and uh, it's an all-around nice guy. So let's thank him for sharing, <laughs> and bless you. Well, in a moment, we're going to enter into our time of uh, community prayer, prayers of the people. And just before we do that, I want to say a few things. Take this moment uh, as your pastor to speak into the moment that we find ourselves as a church family. Um, Bakerview is on a trajectory like many churches are, trying to figure out what's it, what does it mean to be the gathered community coming out of COVID during a time, as Norb said, when we couldn't gather in, in this way. And uh, I just wanna talk about this moment for us as a, as a church family. If you're newer with us today, you're sort of being invited into the living room to hear a little bit about what, what's going on in Bakerview, and we're really glad to have you listen in and be part of it uh, today. So. No doubt there's a mix of us in our Bakerview family who are excited about gathering and are a little bit nervous about it coming out of COVID. We have different uh, 
sensitivities towards our health, towards the pandemic, towards vaccines, all these different kinds of things. We're all in different places. And my encouragement to us is to really up our game in being sensitive to each other, to pay attention to where each other are at in our understanding of the times, how to come out of this season of COVID. There's talk about a fourth wave coming along. We don't know what that means. I don't think very many people really know what it means, but we're learning how to gather in the midst of that coming out of this season. So can we as a Bakerview Church family really be sensitive to one another, learn to listen even more to each other about where we're at in this moment? Then I want to say something else that's a little more specific to Bakerview. Back in the AGM in June, we introduced a ministry plan, and it was a new ministry plan. Bakerview's history, as you know, maybe, maybe you don't know, is we've, for the last 16 years or so, been gathering in three distinct services, three different styles, some at the same time, some at slightly different times. The ministry plan this year is inviting us to gather together on Sunday mornings in one service. This is a change for us. Just like with COVID, we have different responses to the situation. Some welcome change and can hardly wait for new things. Others find change more difficult and find it challenging to approach, even struggle with it. We realize that among us, there is this mix, an excitement about the future and also a lamenting about what we've lost from the past. And we need to name these different things in our church family out loud because they're happening. This is the moment we find ourselves in. What we were before COVID, we're not returning to. We can't. The world has changed and we've changed. And so now we look forward. But while we look forward, we're also lamenting what we've lost. None of the three services that we had are being returned to. None of them. Something new is being charted. And who we are as Bakerview is being held right here in this moment. And it's an exciting moment. And it's a fearful moment. All wrapped up in one, at one time. Over the last 18 months, as I said, the world has changed and we've changed. The one thing that has not changed is our hope in Christ. He's still on the throne. He's still our rock. He's still our savior. The message of hope in Christ that the world needs to hear now as much as ever is the message we have that we need to share and be open with all the time even in the way that we meet and gather with one another. So my prayer, my longing is that we will be a spirit-sensitive church during this time of change. We wanna keep in step with his leadership during these changing times. So I invite you to listen well to him and to listen well to each other. We need to talk. We need to listen well, all the while trusting that Jesus is in charge and he's leading the way. That's my hope and my prayer for us. Ryan, can you put that prayer up on the screen? This is not necessarily a prayer of repentance for this exact moment. It's a good prayer to pray anytime. Take another 30 seconds just to read it. And then we're going to pray it out loud. We come together as a church family. We're here together as a family. But we come as individuals, and so this prayer is one we pray while we're together, but it's for ourselves. Confession and repentance is part of the 
the heart of being a follower of Jesus. We all fall short from time to time, and this prayer is to help us acknowledge that and give us words for sometimes when we don't know the words to pray. So can we pray this together? Let's pray it out loud now. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent for the sake of your son, Jesus Christ. Have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name, amen. Father, we continue to pray for our church family and today we are especially mindful of those who are struggling with health challenges. Today, Lord, we lift up the son of Lois and Bruce Gunther, Cam, who has been recently diagnosed with a brain tumor. Lord, we pray for effective treatment for him and we pray for his wife, Sherry, and their young daughter, Molly, and together with, with Kyle and, and Bruce and Lois and, and their friends and family here and, and beyond today. Give them hope and peace, and we pray for healing for Cam, Lord Jesus. In your name we pray it. Today we lift up Erica Enns, who was diagnosed with cancer in the last couple of weeks. Lord, we pray for an effective course of treatment for her and for peace for Erica and for her, her family as, as they cope with this, and we pray too for healing for her. Lord, we lift up Lois Martins. Lois is experiencing a lot of back pain and, and pain in her joints. Walter is caring for him. Be their strength. Be, be, be their hope. And we too pray, Lord Jesus, that you, the great physician, would, would touch her and bring relief to this great pain that she's experiencing. And today we lift up Dennis Federow, our BC Conference uh, Resource Director, uh, Minister Director. We pray for him as both he and his daughter Rebecca recover from a kidney transplant that uh, he gave to her so that she could live. We pray that she would receive this kidney well and that they would both recover to full health. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, we pray for Pastor Jeff away on vacation during this month of August. We pray that he would have a refreshing break and, and a renewed a time of renewal with his, with his family with his friends, with you. We pray that he would come back refreshed and ready to open your word for us this fall. Thank you for him and thank you for our staff. Give us wisdom and joy and, and unity as a team as we go forward. Thank you for each one who serves so faithfully here. Thank you for our counsel. Bless them. Thank you for their willingness to serve. Give them much wisdom as they go forward into this year. And Lord, beyond ourselves, we pray for our nation. We pray for our country just called into an election this morning. We pray, Lord, that this would be a time where we follow you. We pray for the candidates. We pray for the leaders. We pray for an election campaign that would be focused on issues. Regardless of our take on them, Lord Jesus, we pray that your name would be exalted even in these days. And beyond the borders of our own country today, we lift up the country of Haiti, suffering under another earthquake. Lord, have your mercy on that nation, still suffering from one that happened 10 years ago and now today. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Thank you for meeting, your, meeting our needs as a church family. Thank you for those who give faithfully, regardless of amount, Father. Thank you that you call us to give and to be faithful. And we pray that this act of giving would remind us that we are yours every day of the week, that all we have belongs to you, and that we are your servants wherever we go. And now, Father, bless your servant, Jonathan, as he brings a word from your word to us today. We pray that you would give him wisdom, that your spirit would grace his tongue and prepare our ears and the soil of our hearts to hear what you have to say today. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Jonathan.
Well, good morning. My name is Jonathan. That is correct. I'm the pastor of youth and young adults here. If you don't know that already, uh, welcome here. Uh, we are going through Mark. Uh, we've been going through Mark for the last few months now, and we are into Mark 10, uh, 13 to 31. So I've titled the sermon, Jesus, Children and Fitting Camels Through Needles. So if you already know where we're going with that text, uh, we're going to be talking a lot about wealth. Uh, that, that's going to be a phrase, a word I'm using a lot. And so uh, we didn't do a scripture reading. I'm going to walk us through the text. So if you have your Bible with you, uh, we're going to start in verse 13 in Mark 10. Uh, and we're just going to walk through this. And I want us, as we're going through this passage together, to think about a few things. Uh, one is questions that were on my mind like, what is your vision of the kingdom of God? Or how does the kingdom of God capture your imagination? Um, and what does it mean to belong to the kingdom of God or to receive it? Uh, in your own words, in your mind, think about that. As well as thinking about uh, how would you describe your relationship with wealth or with money? Okay, so that's a lot. I'm already kind of giving you homework to start. Um, but reflect on those things. Uh, and so we're going to go into verse 13 here in Mark 10. Uh, so we have Jesus uh, talking with his disciples here. And he says, people were bringing little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them. But the disciples rebuked them. When Jesus saw this, he was indignant, which means uh, pretty mad. He said to them, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them. For the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly, I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. And he took the children in his arms, placed his hands on them, and blessed them. And so, uh, first off, we see the disciples not doing great here again. This is a bit of a theme through their journey with Jesus. They're human, uh, and they try to restrict who comes up to Jesus. Uh, they, I think, realize Jesus is important, he's significant, he's gaining popularity. People are wondering who this new teacher is, is he the Messiah, what do we call him? Uh, and they're coming up and they want him to bless their children, which was a common thing to have a rabbi do. And the disciples are gatekeeping, they are restricting who gets to come to Jesus because they see him as too important for these people. Uh, and Jesus did not like that. He was indignant, which is not a word we use often, but yes, it means really mad. He was frustrated, angry uh, at the disciples for what they were doing. And he says to them, get out of the way. Um, if we remember a few weeks ago, Jeff did a sermon series, kind of a three-part one, and we talked about uh, getting in line, getting to the back of the line, all these kind of positions that the disciples were called to. If you're first, you must be last. And here he's just telling them to get out of the way. Um, let the children come. And Jesus blessed and embraced the children. Um, and up to this point, Jesus had spoken of children before and given an emphasis to them. So if we go back to Mark 9, uh, 35 to 37, I'll read that out. And so sitting down, Jesus called the 12 and said, anyone who wants to be first must be the very last and the servant of all. He took a little child whom he placed among them. Taking the child in his arms, he said to them, whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me does not welcome me, but the one who sent me. So that was a personal teaching time just days before this for the disciples about children. And they should have been taking notes because right here, Jesus is welcoming children and they're, they're already stopping people. They're saying, no, 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 this isn't what Jesus wants. We know him. We're kind of his bodyguards. We're his, his people in his inner circle. We're going to decide. Uh, and so Jesus is calling them out on all of that. They have it wrong completely here. Uh, they think they're protecting Jesus' time, but they're not. And so Jesus encourages these people to bring their children to them. Uh, and he even emphasizes that the kingdom of God actually belongs to children. And that for one of us, or for someone to enter the kingdom of God, they must be like a child. Um, and so right away I go, well, what does that mean? Because Jesus doesn't say what it means to be like a child. He just says, be like one of these children and you will belong. You will enter the kingdom of God. Um, and so we can think 
my mind first goes to maybe thinking of some characteristics that children possess. Uh, children can be very kind and humble. They can be very curious. Uh, they have a desire to learn. They ask a lot of good questions. Uh, they can exhibit remarkable faith in, in, in people and in God. And so I think that's one way, that's a common way when we read this text to say, okay, we should be like that. We should do as children do and, and exhibit those good characteristics. And the thing is, children also display some less than desirable characteristics. There you go. So we have to acknowledge that. Uh, I'm thinking of just two days ago, Brittany and I were babysitting, uh, and one of the girls, she's four years old, I was building blocks with them, and she came up to me smiling, and she said, oh, is this, is, did you make this? And I said, yes, is this your, is this, uh, is it good? Did, did you like that you made it? I'm like, yeah, it's pretty good. She says, is it your favorite thing you've ever made? And I was being nice, I don't know if it was, it wasn't great. I said yes, and right as I said yes, boom, <laughs> knocks it over. And I sat there, I think my response was, you're acting childish, which is on, I mean, she's a child, so it's fair. Um, but. I, I just sat there in shock, like, she didn't just knock it over. She, like, built me up <laughs> so that the impact of her knocking over would have a sting a little bit harder. <laughs> and I'm preaching, obviously, and I'm thinking about this. I'm like, wow, this is a less than desirable characteristic of all people. Um, but the point is that children are human, just like us. And so when we look at this text, to be childlike, is not to do that. Uh, we can look at these good characteristics, but I want, as I study this, to shed some light on something else in this passage that I think is what Jesus is really getting at, of what it means to be like a child to enter the kingdom of God. There's, uh, in Jesus' time, children were viewed very differently. I think we need to acknowledge that. Uh, children are quite romanticized uh, today. Uh, in, our, in our society, which is good, but back then there were no baby showers, there's no gender reveal parties, uh, there wasn't any of that kind of glamour around children. Children had a function, and that function was that they kept the family line going, and that eventually they could work and support the family. And so uh, that was very much how children were viewed. They didn't have really any rights like we even see today that children have or that people are fighting for, for children around the world to have rights. And this stat, uh, six out of 10 children died before 16 in the first century. So that's quite, uh, yeah, a sobering reminder. So this is, this is the context Jesus is bringing this. Be like a child. And it's not necessarily the, the beauty of children. It's not that that's wrong, but just to realize where children were in the social ladder. Uh, they were at the very bottom. They were not seen like they are today. And then, yet, yeah, Jesus says to let children come to him, and that the kingdom of God actually belongs to them. Not the disciples, these people that have been walking and journeying with him. He doesn't say that it belongs to them. He says it belongs to the children uh, that are right there in front of him. And so with all of that in mind, we can think of the same question of what does it mean to be like a child to enter the kingdom? And I think one of the main points there is that to enter the kingdom like a child is to come with nothing at all. Uh, children are small, they're pretty weak. I don't wanna roast children, but they're not the strongest. They uh, have a struggle to get their voice out, I remember uh, as a kid, always when adults are talking, you could say the same thing a thousand times and they're just kind of patting you on the head, go off. Uh, and so children are vulnerable. They can't even bring themselves to Jesus here. The children aren't just walking up, their parents have to bring them. And so there's a humility, there's a dependability, uh, and an understanding that they aren't bringing anything to contribute to the kingdom as they come. And that, I think, is where Jesus is getting at here. Um, because he ends, and we'll get to verse 31, that the last will be first, the first will be last, that children are bringing nothing in terms of function and productivity in the kingdom. They don't really have gifts. They can't function in the way that a grown uh, Jewish male like the disciples could, but yet it belongs to them. And they were placed central in God's kingdom uh, because of this dependence and humility that children show. And if we remember to last week, as, as Carrie preached, he talked about, even in talk, talking about marriage and divorce, that Jesus was advocating for women. 
by giving them agency in a way that they did not have it in that time. And here, we see him now advocating for children and centering them in the story. And this is something we see throughout the Gospels. Jesus centering people, making people the heroes of the story that in society didn't have any claim to any sort of uh, status or power in that day. So that is something that is beautiful about the Gospels. This vision of the kingdom of God is those kind of people that were on the margins, that didn't have anything to contribute, that were kind of forgotten and put off to the side. They belong in the kingdom. The kingdom belongs to them, that Jesus props them up and centers them in the story. And directly after this story of Jesus saying to enter the kingdom like a child, we get this story of a man who has everything. So children who bring nothing, It's not a coincidence then that we get this story of a rich man who has everything, having a conversation with Jesus. So let me read uh, verse 17 to 22 here. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good, Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony, you shall not defraud, and honor your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said, go sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. So this section starts off with this man running up to Jesus, calling him good teacher. And I won't get into this too much, but Jesus answers in this sort of cryptic way. He doesn't greet the man back. He just questions him. Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. It's very, it feels kind of ominous what he's saying. Uh, And there's a few ways we can understand what Jesus is saying, he's possibly saying to the man that if you're calling me good, you know as an observer of the Torah that only God is good. So do you realize that you are calling me God? Which is true, Jesus is revealing that through his ministry, that he eventually is the Messiah, that he is the son of God, that he's revealing this. So he's basically saying, do you realize what you just said, uh, that I am God? And Just as quickly as that comes up, it goes away and we get into the man's life. And Jesus starts listing off commandments as a way to see if this man earned his money legitimately. And this is important to note because in the first century, about 98% of people lived in abject poverty, like survival on the mind, I need to make sure my needs are met and my family's needs are met. That was 98% of people in the Roman Empire in that time. And then 2% didn't just live with some benefits, they lived in extravagant wealth. So when we talk about a wealth gap today, there was no middle class there. There was no middle class. It was 98% surviving, trying to make it by, and 2% way up here. And the 2%, almost all of them got their money through some sort of injustice or exploitation of people, of those 98%. People were not paid fairly. There was all sorts of stuff going on that we see now that human rights tries to, we're trying to fight against these things. It's still a fight today, but that was the gap then. So that's important for us to note. So Jesus is seeing if this man, who seems to be in that 2%, if he got his money honorably. And the man replies that he has kept these commandments since he was a boy, his whole life. So he has done everything that the Torah uh, calls. He's been an obedient observer of the Torah. He, He is a man of honor. And then we get this statement at the start of verse 21 that I don't want us to miss, that Jesus looked at him and loved him. The Greek word here for looked is emblepo, Uh, And this doesn't just mean to kind of glance. This is the word that means to examine. Uh, kind of scrutinize even is, is a word, which has a bit of a negative connotation, but this means Jesus was looking and examining this man, likely this man's heart. Jesus knows this man's heart, uh, but he takes time, and then he loves him. Uh, from there, he says, you lack one thing. So from that place, we, he doesn't just tell the man he lacks something, 
He, he examines, he looks at this man's life and his heart, loves him, and then he gives him this exhortation. To follow me, you have to release your grip on wealth and sell everything. That's essentially what Jesus is saying to this man. It's quite extreme. Uh, some people would say that this is the, the reason Jesus gives this man this, this call, this command to sell everything is because of how strong this man's relationship with his wealth was, how much it mattered to him. The only way to get out of it was to get rid of it all. There was no middle ground. There was no time to compromise. That, that is one way of looking at this, that it was that strong. This man cared about his wealth. It was so much of his identity that he would have to sell it all to fully be able to enter the kingdom of God and understand how to live and enter like a child. Um, so this man leaves sad uh, because he knows, I believe, just how core to his identity this wealth is. Uh, in the words of Tim Gettert, he says, this interaction between Jesus and this rich man shows us the seductive power of wealth to hold people captive. So, so many stories of Jesus interacting with someone in the Gospels shows them walking away, confessing that this is the Messiah. Look, I've been healed. This man, he loves me like nobody else. There's all sorts of proclamations that come. Once you talk with Jesus, your life is changed. That's kind of a theme throughout the Gospels. And then we have this man walking away sad because he knows how much wealth he has, which is not something we see uh, anywhere else in the Gospels uh, other than this story kind of given in different ways. And I think this conversation with this rich man sheds light for us on the gravity of wealth and power over us as humans. Uh, and it ultimately, the point I wanna make here, actually causes tension or rubs up against how we enter and what it means to participate in the kingdom of God. And so that was a lot, um, and I'm gonna break that down, but I think there's a reason Mark has this story of children coming with nothing and belonging, the kingdom of God belonging to them, right before the story of a man who ends up uh, walking away even though he has everything, um, because he cannot give it all up. And so where do we find ourselves as readers of this story? I think somewhere in the middle. Many of us fall into the middle class as our uh, socioeconomic status, so to speak. We might be in different places, um, but as we know, there was no middle class in Jesus' day. So that's why I think there's such an intensity to how Jesus talks about wealth here, because there was such a large gap. So it's hard for us to know um, what this means for us today completely. Do we have to sell everything? What does it mean to have wealth? At what level would we say someone's wealthy or not wealthy or different grades of wealth? Um, I don't wanna get into all that, but I think a point I can make that I think most of us would agree is that our society, our culture is drawn to wealth. It has our attention. Um, and that's just the start. It has our attention, it can turn to very much have our motivations, our desires, our purpose can become wrapped up in it. But certainly it has our attention. Uh, if we think of TV shows, so there's TV shows that the premise is just, these people are rich, let's see how they live. Let's watch how their lives unfold. And uh, usually people watch, I know I'm guilty of watching things like that, because you want to judge people. You want to see them not have a good life. The last thing you want is for them to be happy, I think because you're somewhat envious, or it's not fair that they have so much wealth that they can't possibly be people who are living lives with depth or good relationships or selflessness or things like that. So we, we, we pay attention to these people because we're drawn to this idea of wealth. And Brittany and I recently had the wonderful opportunity to go sailing with Lois and James Colossen on their sailboat uh, to Bowen Island. And there were so many highlights of our time out on the water, getting that perspective of our, our, our coast and of Vancouver. Uh, it was beautiful. Um, but if I'm honest, one of the things that I think struck me the most and is sticking with me is the yachts that we saw at different marinas, like extravagant yachts, just the nicest, nicer than houses that I've seen, these massive yachts. And I'm just sitting there, and I, it's like, we have our coast, the most beautiful coast in the world, I think, and I'm just locked in on this yacht. I can't stop looking at it. I see the man that's 
probably owns it and his kids are in there and I'm just looking, I'm like, what is your life about? Uh, make a reality show about that guy. I want to know what he's up to. But I, as I was preparing the sermon, I had to ask myself, why was my attention so drawn to that? Like, why could I not keep my eyes off that? Is it because I was looking and saying, oh, I want one of those? I'm up here doing this. I'm not, if that's my goal, that's not the trajectory I think I'm on, uh, is to get a 60-foot uh, luxurious yacht. Do you so I don't ra- think, if I'm honest, it's not my desire to say, have one, ra- but then why? That is, then what a waste of time to, have, to keep my attention on something. Uh, am I judging this person for saying, oh, they live too luxuriously? I think that's Mennonites. We can admit that. Like, I don't know how you can be frugal and spend $500,000 on a yacht. I don't know. Was it clearance? Was it 50% off? I don't know how you would justify that. <laughs> so, we, so was it that? That I, I can't even imagine spending that much money on something because of how I was raised uh, and to, to keep money tight. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, I'll work on that on my own time. Uh, But the point was that this thing had my attention. Uh, That this uh, attention to this, what it tells me is it tells me something about my relationship with money or wealth. So whether I think that person spent too much money, whether I wish I had enough money to buy a yacht like that, it tells us something about the undercurrent of what we think about wealth and how we value it in our world. And I think especially in our Western culture, This is because of sort of paradigm or script that we have within our culture about the benefits or obvious advantages of wealth. So obviously you can, the more money you have, the more you can buy that you want. Uh, That's the kind of explicit obvious answer to why wealth is something that might be nice to have. But I think there's some things that go unnamed under it. Uh, That there's this sort of paradigm that wealth brings things like convenience, security, status, uh, freedom of choice to do more with what you want in your life. And so if we believe that, if that's kind of the graph, the more wealth, the more convenience, the more power, the more freedom, the more happiness we have, if that's the graph that we're going on, I think that actually flies in the face of what it means to be in the kingdom. And that should really challenge us. Because that paradigm is, a, is central to the American dream, certainly, uh, and has massively influenced our culture throughout the world. Uh, that this idea of personal wealth, building your kind of life like that, will bring more health and happiness uh, and good things. And on the other side of that, it'll make you avoid hardships. Life should be easier because it's more convenient. Um, And it's just not that simple. So I have a couple, I'm gonna go through these quickly. Ryan, I have some Instagram posts here. I don't know, this is probably a first in a Bakerview sermon. I don't know if you're gonna be able to see these, but I'm just gonna uh, comment on these a little bit because this is something that's very common in our world. This is from the Instagram account, motivation success daily, okay? So to motivate yourself, that's not a bad thing, but these kind of posts, I think, emphasize this point that I'm trying to make here. So this is our our buddy, Elon Musk. Your future self should be healthy, wealthy, happy. And he obviously is happy. Uh, He was just in space, it looks like, or working on his SpaceX thing. So there we have, this is something that people are drawn to. Uh, You might be drawn to this. Maybe you follow this this account, this kind of desire. Okay, you should be healthy, wealthy, happy. Okay, the next one, Ryan. This one. Uh, is I believe that's Johnny Depp. You can fact check me on that. I don't know if he said this, but it says, I deserve it because I work for it. So if you earn something, it's yours. You rightfully earned it, just like this man. He honorably earned his wealth. So it's his to do with what he wants. This is very common in our world, this kind of private, privatization of wealth. If you've earned it, it doesn't matter what you do with it necessarily. As a Christian, maybe you should tithe but it's a bit taboo to tell people transparently how you use your money because it's yours. Uh, Okay, so that's what Johnny tells us. The next one, forget relationship, find a partner and build an empire. I really just wanted to show this one for Brittany, but she's downstairs. We're not gonna build an empire together, Um, but that's the emphasis they have here. Forget relationship, build your own empire. Okay, I think there's one more. And we have Leo. Uh, Only you and you alone can change your situation. Don't blame it on anything or anyone. And some of the comments, people say, 
fix your friends, fix your life, true, true. All of the rich guys know this, don't blame anybody. So true, you can only save yourself. So this is, I think, a, a worldview that we might be caught up into a degree, but it's certainly in our world. Uh, pick yourself up by your bootstraps. You have personal responsibility for your life, and that's how you should live. You should live, and the more you work hard, the more you'll become, like Elon Musk, healthy, happy, life will be good. And that's just not how life always works. There are so many stories of people who have worked so hard, and the cards they were dealt did not allow them to succeed in that kind of way. And what do we say about that as Christians? Because ultimately, I think what I'm trying to say here is even if that's the paradigm we follow, that wealth can provide more convenience, security, safety, ultimately, we can never fully control uh, our lives and the world around us. And we shouldn't want that. Um, uh, a very quick story of this time when Brittany and I, uh, I've only done it once, we did an all-inclusive vacation uh, with her mom down to Mexico. It was a classic, you know, it's February here, we're gonna go, and maybe some of you have done this before, and this was my reflection from it. Um, you, we do this thing to escape our winter, to kind of have this time, this ultimate way to rest and relax away from the, our busy lives, which is good, it's good to have that time of rest. Um, and when we got there, I mean, everything is all included. You don't have to think about food. You don't have to think about anything. You can just do whatever you want and relax. And on the first day, we get out to the pool, and it starts raining. And there is like a panic of, of people around there. Like people, the, there's this couple from Cleveland. We had came that day, and the guy was half joking, saying, it's your fault it's raining. You got here today. And because they had built everything. They live in Cleveland. I think it's similar February to here. They want to get away. They've built up this in their head. This will be so good. There'll be no hardship, nothing to worry about, easy breezy, a great week. And rain comes, something as simple as rain. And it's shattering people's days. Like, we, how do we relax? We have to be inside. This isn't good. This is inconveniencing. Because the reality is an all-inclusive does not include full climate control. We can never get there. <laughs> so these people, something that is normal, you know, we complain about the rain here, but because of what we've set up with this kind of all-inclusive vacation, this amount of wealth that it is, it actually shifts the perspective that something like rain is that much more of an inconvenience. That because you set this up, it actually makes it harder to deal with very simple things in life. And I think that's one of the ways that wealth can get in the way of our following Jesus in his kingdom, that it gives us a perspective on life that uh, is more about the things we want and not the simplicity of life. Uh, and that's something that's very much a reality for all of us in the world we live in uh, today. And so uh, the next part I want us to be aware of is how these texts work together uh, of Jesus contrasting being childlike and having wealth as a part of our identity. Because we have this story of Jesus centering children as the example of entering this new way of life, uh, this kingdom that's a new way to order the world. And children are the lowest of lows, as I said before, um, and yet that's who we're called to be like. And we see how much Jesus teaching on wealth and riches here throws off the disciples as we look at the final nine verses here. Uh, I'll read 23 to 25. Jesus says, looks around and said to his disciples, how hard is it for the rich to enter the kingdom of God? The disciples were amazed at his words, which is kind of like, not just like pleasantly amazed, like shocked. They could not believe he said that. But Jesus said again, children, how hard is it to enter the kingdom of God? It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. And I think this has been misused all the time, that we take the, the extremes, if you are rich, however we define that, you better sell everything or you're inherently more selfish than other people. And I think to bring it to that extreme doesn't uh, give us the self-reflection that Jesus is calling his disciples to and calling us to uh, about our own relationships with wealth. No matter how much we have, we have some sort of relationship with it. And it, 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 it impacts our life and it is a part or not a part of our identity in some way. And so Jesus uses this conversation with this rich man as a teaching moment for the disciples um, because they were amazed because he's flipping this on its head for them. 
Uh, disciples in that time, a Jewish person would have had the idea that wealth was a sign of God's favor. Uh, this is all throughout the Old Testament, we see this. Uh, and so they just saw this rich man who has wealth and observes the Torah walk away from Jesus disappointed. And they're probably thinking, like, man, that was, that was the person that should be inheriting eternal life. Like, they had everything. They're obviously blessed by God. They've observed the Torah. Why are they so sad? And so Jesus is flipping this right on its head for them. Because that simple paradigm in, in first century time, in biblical times, that if you have God's favor, you're wealthy, or if you're obedient to God, you'll become wealthy, uh, was a simple paradigm that failed as well then. That, uh, that that doesn't necessarily describe the complexity and realities of life. We see this in the story of Job. Job is an obedient, observant person. He follows God. He has this life, but he, he gives it all up to God. This is not his own. He's not selfish with it. And he loses it all. And his friends come up to him and basically say, like, what did you do? You don't have God's favor anymore. What sin did you commit? And he did not commit a sin. And I believe that is a story to show us that life isn't that sort of karma. You do more good and God blesses you more. You do bad, obviously something happened. That's not the way uh, our world works. I think that simplifies it and that ends up with us saying things like, well, if you are wealthy, God blesses you more. And if you aren't wealthy, you should pick yourself up and work harder and become wealthy. Or that you've done something wrong, that if you don't have a certain amount of wealth, you are inherently doing life wrong. And that's not how we speak in the kingdom of God. We all come like children, vulnerable and dependent and understanding uh, that it is through God we are saved, that his grace comes over us and we live our life not for ourselves, but for, for God and for the world. And so this is how Jesus is flipping this with the disciples. And they ask, who then can be saved? Likely because they're thinking, well, if that man can't be saved, he was like a, the perfect student, so I don't know who can be saved, Jesus. And Jesus explains that no one can save themselves, it is through God alone that salvation comes. And so this ends, the last few verses end with uh, Jesus sharing with them uh, what it means uh, to be a part of the kingdom. So from verses 26 to 31, uh, it says, the disciples were even more amazed and said to each other, who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them. With man, this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. Then Peter spoke up. We have left everything to follow you. I think that's Peter being a little insecure, like making sure God knows, like, hey, we, you know, like we should be a part of it. We gave up a lot. We sacrificed a lot. And that's, that. anytime that happens when, uh, when you do something nice for someone, but then you expect the validation, I think it shows a little bit of the motivation, shows a little bit of maybe Peter's relationship with wealth and how it was affecting him. But he says this to Jesus, we left everything to follow you. Jesus says, truly I tell you, no one has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me and the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age. Homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children and fields, along with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. And so, uh, I want to close uh, reflecting on that a bit. There's a lot to say in there, but that list that Jesus uh, is bringing is really the things that are essential to a Jewish person in that day. Uh, fields meant their source of income. When you had fields, you had property, you had income. Family mattered, because family's what kept going. Ancestry matters so much. That's why we have lists of ancestry through the Bible. It mattered uh, in their relationship with God. And so what Jesus is saying to them, and I think saying to us today, is that to become one in the kingdom of God, we have to hold up our relationship with wealth uh, and what it means to enter like a child and, and have a hard conversation with ourselves of those don't always go together. Uh, that there's some repentance there, there's some honest reflection there. But when you join the kingdom, it's not all doom and gloom that you have to come in kind of shoulder shrug, like I, have, I gave up everything and now what do I get in return? No, Jesus describes the life of one in the kingdom, that you give these things up, but you gain a home, you gain belonging in a community, 
You gain brothers and sisters and people who love you and care for you in community together in Christ. Uh, you don't worry about your income only as the only value of wealth, but you understand the generosity of the people around you and your ability to be generous within a community. And so this is something we keep up, and we've seen the church keep up through uh, the decades and the centuries, that we are called to be people who live this way, that when you join the kingdom, you are joining a community, and we live a certain way where the first will be last and the last will be first. And so uh, I'm going to call Carrie up, and we might have some time for some reflection um, to, to think about this, because I want us, as we understand the beautiful vision that Jesus has for the world, uh, it should actually rub up against some of the things we see in the world, and that's the task as a disciple to be faithful in that. And so, uh, yeah, Carrie, come on up. Thank you, Jonathan. You brought a lot for us to uh, consider this morning, so that was, uh, that was good. Uh, what do we do with this word that we've heard? We don't wanna just say, hey, Jonathan, that was a great message, and off we go and not think about it. We wanna engage with each other about this. So I'm gonna give you a 90-second assignment here with each other, maybe in a group of two or three or four. If you end up by yourself, that's okay. But I want you to ask this, answer this question. To what is the Spirit drawing your attention from the sermon this morning? What is the, the thing that you're going, whoa, that was for me? If you have courage, just say that to one or two people around you. Maybe it's the person you came with. Just lean and chat with each other for 90 seconds. This is going to be your precursor to your lunch conversation. Are you ready? Go. I really like how Mark and his wisdom contrasted these, put these two stories right side by side. The child and the rich young ruler, we often call him. One of the verses that came to mind as Jonathan was preaching for me was, blessed are the poor in spirit. There's something about happiness and joy and blessing in those that know they have little or nothing, because that's when God comes in, and that's the upside downness of the kingdom. Jesus' message is a countercultural message. We do not depend on ourselves, we depend on Him. He's our model in that. And so, to close our time today, we're going to read a scripture together, and then we'll be blessed with the benediction and ascending. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God 
something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of their surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Well, friends, we have gathered, and now it's time to go. As followers of Jesus, we are those who are sent. While here in this room or listening in today, We've been challenged to live as those who trust God for all things. We've been encouraged to depend on our Heavenly Father rather than on the things of this world. We've been invited to come to him with a posture of humility, with that of a child who really has nothing to bring. May such humility grace us now as we go, for we are sent into the world to be the hands and feet of Jesus, to be his voice of love and hope, not with anything we muster up ourselves, but with a quiet confidence that he is with us and giving us everything we need. And as we go, let us also remember that we are sent to one another, to each other, even here in our church family, even as we leave this place this morning, I encourage you to reach out to each other with kindness, care, interest, and love. Would you stand now as we...